So, 2023 is over. It's gonna come down as the fastest and the most boring year we have ever lived. T -t -t Tell me I'm not the only one. But you know what? Thank God, because those boring months have been compensated with amazing and memorable movies, which we never had since 2019. And I guess it is safe to say that 2023 is an amazing year for cinema, just like we always say every year. And for that, I'll be listing or rank my 10 favorite films of 2023. I wish I could rank at least 20 movies for this video, but I decided to just stick with 10 and add the other films that didn't make it to some honorable mentions, which I'm gonna flash in a few seconds because I don't have any much to say and I'm too lazy to write. And now, onto my top 10 films of 2023. Do you ever watch a film where it's barely nothing but so full of everything? Does that question make sense? Fallen Leaves is the movie that when I first saw the poster, I immediately thought, I'm gonna love this movie. I mean, look at the visuals, the way the vibrant colors pop in contrast to the dark background. Clearly, the cinematographer Timo Salminen and the director Aki Karasmaki know how to make scenes eye-catching with the way they play with lighting and color grading. If Pedro Modavar and Philip Lorca de Cochelle worked together to make a movie, this is what it would look like. Apart from the amazing visuals, the story is not that complicated to follow because it's a pretty straightforward love story about two oddly sad people. The world that they're living and the way they talk is really strange but also funny because of its deadpan humor and there's not much dialogue which may bore most audiences but to me it works. I believe that this kind of movies are really hard to pull off and Aki Kurosmaki did a wonderful job in making this weirdly interesting from start to finish. This next movie is something you should watch with your family. I I'm just kidding, don't, don't watch this with your family. Rotting in the Sun, directed by Sebastian Sova, is probably the most bizarre film I have seen last year. It was the first film that I've seen of his, so I went over it blindly and I was invested the entire time. It's a dark comedy thriller that deals with existential crisis and death. It was presented in a weird and unique and hilarious way that I don't think I have seen before. There's a lot of close-up shots of faces and wieners, yep. But seriously, the camera work on this is pretty good. It looks like if Emmanuel Lubezki does Dogma 95 with a bit of budget. Jordan Firstman, in whom you will love and hate for his character, delivered such an entertaining role, as well as the stellar performance from Catalina Saavedra. I will definitely look forward to Sebastian Silva's other works because I had a really great time watching this one. Wedderburn became much weepy and sweary when he discovered my whoring. I find myself nearly jealous of the men's time with you, rather than any moral aspersion against you. It is your body, Bella Baxter, yours to give freely. I'm very much aware of Yorgos Anthemus as a filmmaker, and how his films have this weird and unsettling feel to it. But even having that knowledge, I feel like this new film of his is so different from the movies he has made before. Poor things with its quirky and absurd comedy is what makes this film worthy of being on this list for me. If you look at it from an obvious lenses, it's basically a female version of Frankenstein. But if you delve into it deeply, you will see that it's an exploration of humanity and self-discovery and an observation of human tendency and behavior. This is probably one of the most well-crafted movies last year in terms of technical aspects of filmmaking. The acting, the makeup and hairstyling, the score, cinematography, the costume design, the production design. Gosh, what a gorgeous looking movie. It kinda reminds me of a Salvador Dali painting. And also the idiosyncratic direction from Yorgos Lanthimos. Sometimes it makes me ask these questions of why and how is he doing all of this absurdity in his films, but I'm also glad that someone is doing it because I feel like no one will ever do it but him. So yeah, it feels so surreal that this movie was made and that we're able to witness it. 
It's really exciting that it's gonna go down in history and be observed and studied by future generations. I remember being so excited when I first found out that there's another Miyazaki movie to be released last year. And boy, it didn't disappoint. The Boy and the Heron, just like any other Studio Ghibli movie, makes me feel so happy and calm. This film is said to be autobiographical and you can sense the sentimentality in the story and how it uncovers. Its optimistic outlook on grief and loss and legacy is one of the best aspects of it. The amazing world building and dreamlike quality is nothing new in a Miyazaki film. But damn, he really is a master of his craft. It's like a fever dream that you want to end but also don't want to end. Sometimes it gets a little confusing but that's the thing that appeals to me about this film. It challenges you to seek and ask questions in your head and contemplate. It's a two-hour film of pure bliss and nostalgia combined with beautiful and enticing scenery and animation. I just can't wait to buy and collect some Wada Wada plushes. This isn't the beginning of something, Augie. Isn't it? Is it? Probably not. Unless maybe it is. I was a bit hesitant to watch Asteroid City last year after the bad reception it received from a bunch of critics and people who have seen the film. Well, the man obviously doesn't care anymore whether people are gonna like his films or not as he continues to make polarizing movies more and more. So I just said, whatever, I'm gonna watch it and make my own conclusions. And I'm so glad I did. To be honest, I was confused during the first half of the movie. I was like, what the heck is happening here? Like, I don't know where the story is going or how it will end, but halfway through the film is when it started to get my attention and it continued to be more interesting up until the end. You can tell that this is one of, if not the most personal film that Wes Anderson has made. It touches on a lot of things like grief and life's uncertainty, and it's impressive how he can show honesty and rawness and emotion with his meticulously calculated style of filmmaking. Which I think what causes the downfall of his last movie before this with its lack of emotional weight and more on the visual aesthetic of the storytelling. But in this, he balanced it all out and made a cohesive film. Not to mention the humor which makes it more entertaining. The set design is so beautiful to look at, no surprise on that, and the pastel yellow color grading works really well with the feel and the theme of the movie. There's a lot of depth and layers to its story that you will discover as you watch it. It's such a profound movie that left a lingering feeling on me after seeing it. As an aspiring artist myself who loves to draw and paint occasionally because I'm too uninspired to do it consistently, this movie resonated with me on a deeply personal and spiritual level. Showing up directed by Kelly Reichardt is an introspective film about being an artist and the struggles and insecurities revolving around it. I've watched a few Reichardt movies before and she's becoming one of my favorite working directors right now. She's kind of like in the league of Richard Linklater with her slow and minimalist style of filmmaking, capturing the mundane life of people. And I'm a sucker for that kind of movies. It's probably my favorite kind of drama in the broad spectrum of the genre. Making art is not that easy. You know from thinking of something unique and original and the unrewarding process of creating it, either you will end up loving your piece or completely unsatisfied with it, until you end up in a loop of being stuck and the never-ending insecurity. Sometimes I think people have no idea how frustrating and unfulfilling the whole process of creating something. Considering the world that we live in wherein art is treated more as a luxury and not a necessity, an artist as a human being has real life responsibilities too, so imagine having to balance it all out. I feel like showing up did a great job in encapsulating all that feeling in a quiet and honest and uninsightful way. I think it was two years ago since I watched the 2011 film Once Upon a Time in Anatolia for the first time, and it's definitely one of the best films I've seen of the past decade. Last year, its Palme d'Or winning director made another movie that premiered at Cannes Festival. About Dry Grasses, directed by Nuri Bilye Ceylon, is a three-hour film about life from a point of view of a conceited man who is stuck in the rural land of Anatolia where he feels out of place. Its elaborative and restrained way of telling a story is truly compelling. It's also more of like a character study of this egocentric man and how being self-centered can make you do terrible things to others, even to your friends. Its three-hour runtime may be intimidating to some, and I completely understand that, but trust me when I say that finishing a three-hour movie is so rewarding, especially if it's this good. A lot of people compare style of filmmaking to some legendary filmmakers like Bergman and Tarkovsky, and you can definitely sense that in his way of blocking out a scene and his use of long takes. It's intended and deliberate and really immersive. The beautiful cinematography and his use of landscape as a backdrop helps a lot as well. There's this one scene that was so shocking because it was so abrupt after a long scene of just pure dialogue, and it's such a great way to shake things up. 
This film is riveting from the performances and the writing, it's thought-provoking and it's poetic cinema in its truest sense. Okay, it might be cheating a little bit on this one, since technically this movie is a 2022 film because it was initially released in like late 2022 but at its wide release in like early 2023 so... Anyway, The Eight Mountains is the film that I saw earlier last year and it stayed with me for like the whole year. Directed by two Belgian filmmakers, Felix van Groningen and Charlotte van der Meersch, this film is about friendship and self-discovery and how two people who see the world differently found solace and understanding for one another. It was set in the stunning alpines of Italy and the way it was shot is really breathtaking. What's interesting to me is that even though it has this 4x3 aspect ratio, it feels so panoramic and majestic in its scope, allowing the scenic views to entice you. The 2.5 hour duration doesn't feel that long even though it's a bit slow paced. But the pacing is great, which helps the story to explore the journey of these two main characters, the events in their lives and how it affected them, the decisions that they make and the consequences of it, and how it molded them into who they are as an individual. Some people said that this is Brokeback Mountain for straight bros, and I never realized that and it kinda is. But the way that they show brotherly love is tender and beautiful. I still couldn't stop thinking about this film. It's moving and gorgeously shot, and it's definitely one of the films that I will not hesitate to see again. I always look at the Cannes Film Festival selection every year and check out the movies that I would be excited to see once it's released. And oftentimes I anticipate to see the Palm d'Or winning films because I believe that Cannes usually gets it right more than the Oscars. In popular opinion? Last year's winner of Golden Palm is definitely one of the movies that I anticipated a lot and when I finally saw it, I thought, Cannes did it right again. Anatomy of a Fall is a courtroom drama movie directed by Justin Trier. The way that this film's story uncovers is nothing I have seen before from this genre of movie. It doesn't want you to answer the question of who done it, but wants you to see and understand how situations like this affect people that are involved emotionally and the ways and things that they would do to resolve it. While it will keep you guessing on who is right and who is wrong, it also challenges your morals on who and what you believe in. What I like about this film as well is that you can feel from the screen the confidence in the writing and the directing from Justin Trier. It's focused and sharp and she has a clear vision of what she wants to project and it shows. Every single one of the actors gave such strong performances like there's no bad apple to throw away. Even Messi the dog gave an Oscar worthy performance. It's a meticulously crafted and cleverly structured mystery drama film that I believe will be in conversation for many years to come. I always have three main criteria of picking my number one movie of the year. First is, well, the overall technicality of it, which includes directing, the acting, the story and how it was presented, the script and the screenplay, the use of score and music, etc. etc. Second is how it affected me, whether it is mentally, emotionally, or even spiritually. And last is the rewatchability. How will I view or my opinion of the movie three or five or ten years from now, and will it change or will it still be the same? And I think my number one movie of 2023 fits all of these criteria that I mentioned. The Holdovers is so simple with its story and structure, yet it's so charming and captivating that you can't do anything but just watch the movie from start to finish without being interrupted. This is directed by Alexander Payne, and as someone who has seen almost all of his films, except for the last movie of his before this one for obvious reasons, this is probably one of his finest works since Sideways. I guess we can all agree that last Christmas season was probably the worst Christmas season ever. As Sophie and Steven said, well at least for me and good for you if you had a great one. I saw this film I think a week before Christmas and I'm glad because it was the perfect time to watch it. The film was set in the holiday season during the 70s wherein the three main characters were being put up together during the Christmas break. One of the key components that made this movie perfect is the production design. It's very reminiscent of the 70s with the tonality and the lighting. Not to mention the use of music is also great. And it certainly helps you to be immersed with the holiday season with its warm and cozy vibe. As the film progressed, the three main characters learn so much about each other, their differences and somehow their commonalities in terms of their struggles in dealing with life. A professor who is unsatisfied and frustrated with his life, a student who is unhappy being left behind during Christmas, and a woman who runs the school cafeteria in his morning and seeking comfort after the recent death of her son. All of these characters have a lot to offer to the story. They're multidimensional and you will sympathize with all of them. The characters are definitely the strongest point of the film, the way they were explored in a deeply human level. I don't know why but personally I find Paul's character the most relatable even though I'm still young. But I think you will find bits and pieces of each character relatable. Which is why towards the end you will feel really close to these characters and will somehow make you feel sentimental. I mean what else can I say? It's a great film that found the right balance between being comedic and heartwarming. 
It's already engraved in my mind and I will definitely remember it for the rest of my life. So yeah, that concludes my top 10 films of 2023. It's been a while dear and I'm hoping for a much crazier year this 2024. Hopefully not in life you know but in movies. Can't wait to see and experience what's in store for us in the future. Hope you're all doing well and have a great year.